let's get into it. We'll try and we'll try and run on to a kind of uh, a schedule here, and um, lots to share and lots to see. So um, there is a document we'll run through, um, but it's also kind of a freestyle kind of conversational thing. So Loaf, if you wouldn't mind tabbing us on, mate. Um, so yeah, we'll run through what's been happening with Eternum in terms of the game design and the development. We'll run through the roadmap for Eternum and how our roadmap relates to the developments of the Startlight Network. Then we'll have a kind of uh, a kind of creative interlude, and Amaro will share some of his latest work and thinking. It's just open to share what he feels like sharing. Then we'll go on to part four, which is talking about adventurers, which I think, to be honest, is one of the more or the least understood parts of the project. And I think everyone will be a lot clearer about what role it plays in the Realms gaming ecosystem after this conversation. Uh, and then we'll actually demonstrate how adventurers might come to life in a prototype game that Threep has built using Crypts and Caverns. And then, uh, yeah, another little creative interlude. We'll, we'll speak to Casey who has been putting together like, the soundscape and it's wonderful. So he can just tell, about, tell us about his process and how he's actually working with Cairo as well. Um, and then we'll wrap up with like, some other news and a, a AMA. So any questions, you can kind of jump in at any point, but there's definitely going to be a, a time at the end. And we'll try and keep this to 75 minutes. 75 minutes that's the uh, maybe stretch to 90 but we'll try and keep it trim cool uh and then yeah <laughs> L- loaf can speak to this much better than i can but mm. we're going to do that some of this demo live and so starknet is in alpha and it can be um slow and it can be buggy but if you also remember that starkware has put through more transactions than any other led to uh, to date or via um Via Starkware, so you know we yeah. believe. I was and just going to uh, say, <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, I, I'm, you know, every, every developer is, you know, um, uh, you know, talking with them, and you know, there's a hundred people working on Starknet right now, um, and you know, it's a, it's a very ambitious, ambitious um, project, but they're, they're taking leaps and bounds, and there are some, um. You know, it, it is an alpha network, so especially on, running on the DevNet. So, you know, sometimes things take longer than expected. Um, but it's definitely not an indication of what the final network's going to be like, that's for sure. Okay, cool. And then, so just before we get into some of the detail of, of, of the latest, I think it's good to reflect to people who might be joining or um, seeing Realms for the first time. So for newcomers, welcome. Um, Bibliothek DAO is a decentralized Web3 game studio. We're building an on-chain game ecosystem called Realms. We're very fortunate to have built a community of um, players, which is really rich with developer and engineering talent. And so I think that's part of being born from the Loot universe and which has been a magnet for, for builders. But we've been a kind of a, a lightning rod for a lot of that talent. We are pioneering with um, Layer 2 Starks, Validity Rollups. So we are working very closely with Starknet and will be hopefully one of the lead projects, particularly at the time of launch. Um, we are building modular by design and everything we do, um, we're thinking about impro- interoperability and composability with other loop projects and with other Starknet projects. And I think that's been demonstrated in the last 48 hours with the integrations that you worked through over the weekend, both. Uh, and then the core lords. So this, this, the games, the game experiences will come from two directions. So the core team, the core lords, will build games. So Eternum is the is the first example of that. But the team will also be building primitives and infrastructure in an open source fashion, which means that developers in the community can build games using all of our open source code and our permissionless assets. So the the game experiences come from us but also from other people in the DAO and people in the community. And finally, to wrap up the, you know, an open invitation, um, if you want to contribute to designing and developing this game world, you probably can just come along and spend some time in Discord and, and kind of work your way into something. And 
lots of people have gone from community member to to core lord and there's, there's certainly lots of people contributing on a day-to-day -day basis so yeah the first the first kind of part is realms eternum and so i'll just really quickly talk through what realms eternum is so it's a browser-based strategy game with building trading raiding and diplomacy so you're an agent in this world to play the game however you want to it's the meta game of the realms ecosystem it's an eternal game people can build empires and they'll rise and they'll fall but there's decay built into this world so it allows people to join later and still you know still compete um you need one of 8000 realms nfts to to play and you can play you know by yourself you can play cooperatively or as an order or as part of a guild we're putting the tooling in place to allow people to interact in different ways with the game uh and it will be the first game released by Bibliothek Adel, and we are now on pre-alpha v3 and i think that that's what loaf is going to share with you now yes so this is what we've been building can you still my still my screen didn't crash we i good? can yeah we still good okay so yeah so this is what we have been building for the last nine months well not the only thing we've been building but this is the um the core game that we've been building and this is the current build um you know it's it's all running in the browser um this is going to be like our first client uh and it's definitely not going to be the last client and by client i just mean like the interface um you know we, we take an iterative approach to you know everything we're doing from the contracts to the design to the um interface so so yeah so this is the current build this is the world um every realm has its own x y coordinates on this map um and these x x y coordinates actually exist on chain too so this is just a you know visual representation of everything that's happening on chain um but all the logic and all the state is 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 all is all running on chain someone could come along and i think there is actually a community member right now uh, he might not be on the call but uh he's actually working on another another kind of um visualization for the atlas which is going to be cool so i'll uh i'll just kind of go through you know uh you know standard standard day in the realm um as a real as a realm lord and it'll probably give you a good understanding of everything so these little black castles these are my realms um i'm pretty spread out in the map uh but i'll just go to one and let's see um so I've got two vault days here. Um, I can also see, like, you know, I can see the distance between my realms. Uh, and this is all based on off, like, the XY coordinates as is calculated. And then you can travel from realm to realm. Um, and it takes, like, a real, real time, a uh, real daytime. So I'll just go to my realm. So this is my realm. I haven't really built up this realm at all because uh, I think I only minted it, what, two days ago. Um, but uh, let's have a look. Uh, how about I go... Actually, I might go to my other realm. So this is my Empire page. Um, this is like the kind of dashboard that you come to, and you can see everything that's happening. You can see your mercantile history, everything that you've done. Uh, you can see your battle history, if you've like raided someone or if you've been raided. Uh, so this is where you come and check every day. You can see your laws balance, settled realms, how many relics I hold, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Um, go to my quick actions. This can harvest all my resources if they're available. Um, this is just to mint realms for the test. Uh, and these are my these are my realms in the card view. So I'll go to go to this realm because I think I already have something here. So. You can see I've, I've I've built a defending army already, so he's defended, defendable, but it's raidable um, because I haven't been attacked in the last 24 hours. And you can see I'm kind of amassing quite a vault here, um, and I'm also using some land. Uh, I go to my military tab, and I can see I am I've got a mage tower, um, but let's say I want to build a barracks. 
Um, so you can see like I'm, I'm kind of short on all these resources. So I, I got two options here. I can either go to the back, go to the um, marketplace and I can quickly queue up um, a barracks and this will automatically buy the barracks uh, resources from the market. Exactly what I need, except I don't have enough lords, so I can't actually do that. <laughs> um, so let's not do that because I'm quite poor at the moment. Uh, but I can summon an army. And, well, I don't have any resources for them either. I'm quite broke. Okay, well, see, in this scenario, you can go to the, uh, go to the bank, you can buy individual resources, um, uh, and, you know, and fix your, fix your shortfall. Um, and, you know, you do this just by adding resources. And, you know, you queue them up. And this is our um, native AMM, which is, uh, you know, our lords to resource marketplace. So everything has to be traded with lords. Um, and you can trade as many resources as you want at once. So you can either buy these resources or you can sell them just like that. And you just sell. And so I can just, I just queued that up to sell these resources to get me some lords. Um, and that transaction now appears in my transaction cart. Um, but we don't need to do anything just yet. We can just like leave it in the cart because I'll, I'll, I'll queue up some more transactions to show you guys like the power of um, account abstraction and multi-call. So I've got those queued up. Um, I'll sell those resources. And why don't we just go back to realms and try to find a, a, a realm to raid. So I needed some dragon hide. I don't know if there's actually any dragon hide realms settled yet. But there is mithril, so we can go after this guy instead. Um, and you can see I, I've got we've got um a Starknet ID integrated. So if uh if you haven't got your Starknet ID yet, I would suggest go and like lock one in because uh, there's been quite a few that have been registered. So like if you want a name preference, then just go and do it because they will appear like wherever um, wherever there's like a wallet address, your little Stark ID will appear. So we'll know who who's who. Um, so I can target Squid and Redbeard and Secretive quite easy. Um, so I'll. There's, there's a lot to cover, so I apologize if I'm going fast, but um, you could probably spend a lot of day, or, you know, a lot of time just digging through all the little details. But since this guy has Mithril, um, um, I want to attack him. Um, I actually, or actually already have an army on his realm, as you can see here, it says here, so it actually already exists. So, I can actually do this. And uh, you can see this is my, um, this is the combat screen. Um, still, still a work in progress. And uh, you can see here I've got, I can, this will actually be a hefty haul if I, if I succeed, successfully um, destroy him, which I might. Uh, Maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe. But we'll just rate it anyway. Um, this might uh, take a little while because Starknet's quite slow at the moment. So we might just um, do that. And if it hasn't processed in time, we can come back to it later. Maybe later in the call. It's, um, yeah, I think seeing Starknet's like just in the middle of, um, uh, like, they're... they're there's this, there's this, there's this thing called parallelization in in software where like it means you can, um, you, you can process like more than uh, like computers can do more than one task at a time, and so most uh, like uh, JavaScript and uh, there's a bunch of languages that, that are like single threaded, meaning you can they can only do like one thing at a time, right? And um, actually the EVM chain, so as in theory mainnet, can only do one transaction at a time, um, and parallelization means that you can do more than one transaction at a time. And so Starknet's in the in in the midst of actually doing this upgrade for it, um, which will allow transactions to process like at the same time. So, uh, you know, for you know for if it, if it starts at like a hundred, um, you know, uh, transactions a second, and that's the cap. Um, you use parallelization. You can stack like two machines together, and then you can get two hundred transactions a second. Um, and it actually scales 
um, as well, so you can just keep stacking uh, machines together, which is like which is, which is going to be a huge unlock and um, uh, throughput increase. So we can just leave that. That'll that'll just keep processing. But I'll show you the um, multi-call, which is really like this is the real key like key change like key unlock in non-chain games in my mind. It's like I like to call it like the broadband moment uh, because it's really annoying having to you know just sign transaction after transaction tra transaction that like, kind of breaks the whole immersion of a game. Um, but with a multi-call, you know you can queue up all these transactions. Um, so I've got this one queued up, and I'll go queue up some others. Um, go back to my realms. Um, I'll go to this guy. And maybe I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll build some more fishing villages. Queue that up. And you can really actually queue up as many, like, as, uh, I don't think it's a limit. I think Squiddy got up to, like, 50 or something. Um, the only, that the, the, like, it's really, the only thing is, is that with these transactions is that uh, they are still, like, determined by, like, the blockchain, as in, I can't, you know, build something, a building, um, if I don't have the resources available. Right, it won't. It will. Everything will fail in this um, multi-call. However, if I buy resources in the first like block of this transaction, and then use those resources in the next block, the actual the whole transaction will go through. Um, which is which is kind of insane. So I'll. I can just do this. Okay. Right. Let's just send one of our um, other armies to another resource. I am in need of some Ignium. Oh, we don't have any Ignium either. Oh, there's none readable. Okay, let me just go. Yeah, okay. This guy's got a hole. Um, so you can see here, I've got these little two little travel buttons. And these are my armies, so I might just travel. Um, uh, this guy. So it's going to take me 20 minutes to travel here. So I'll just do that. Queues up travel. And that gets added to my queue. Um, and now, after 20 minutes, that army will arrive at that realm, and then I'll be up to attack it. And the travel time might take... Uh, uh, like, right, right now, we've kind of got it at, like, the shortest... Well, the, the longest period of travel time will be, like, one and a half days. Um, and the shortest will be like, you know, like 20, 20 minutes or something. Um, yeah, so I've got these three transactions that I can't now, and I can just sign for one transaction. And that processes them all. And so I don't need to do one at a time. And I can just do that. Oh, you can't see the little window. Yeah, so these are all. Um, uh, this is processing now, in our in my cart, and we'll see what uh when that processes. Uh, yeah. So this is really the um. Yeah, that's we, we covered a lot just then. Was there anything you think I missed, secretive? I think um army composition. Ah. So I think that the, a lot of the strategy is going to come down to, mm. you know, how you compose your army versus mm -hmm. the army that you're going to raid. Exactly. Yeah. Multiple multiple armies moving around the board at the same mm -hmm. time. So that that kind of thing, perhaps at the combat. Mm. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the troops. Uh, let's just go back to. So the troops actually, they're they all have one counter to them, and so uh, you know, um, uh, magic, uh, a strong versus infantry, um, you know, archers, uh, strong versus magic, um, knights of strong versus archers, and you know, infantry strong versus cavalry. 
And so, you know, if you come up against a realm that has, you know, who's just been lazy and just bought a barracks and built some, you know, soldiers, then, you know, you can uh, whip up an army that has apprentices and um, arcanists in them and absolutely destroy them. And um, that's kind of the, the, you know, the strategy around, um, you know, winning these battles. You know, it, it's like, it's the army composition. You can't just, uh, you know, you can't just expect to survive with just having one, um, one lot of troops um, as you'll get smashed. So, uh, and, and this is like, like this is like the first design, but we're hoping that like a interesting metagame will appear where, um, you know, some resources might become cheap. So that means some units might become cheap and then we start to see a lot of them on the map. Um, but then those, those resources start getting bought up. Um, so that resources becomes more expensive. Um, and then maybe maybe a different uh, army composition starts appearing more. Um, so it'll be like this constant flow um, uh, flow of different compositions going around the map. And this is really like like we've spent a lot of time trying to work out this um, combat system. And Fermentador, um, I'm not sure if he's on the, he's on the call. Yeah. So Fermentador's designed the um, uh, combat system around this, and you know it's all been built in Cairo, and it's taken quite a bit of time. We've gone through quite a few iterations because, um, you know, doing on-chain uh, combat is quite tricky, um, especially when it's like PvP um, with like a d lots of like different uh, elements to it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's going well. Okay, nice. Well, I think probably then if the the, the raid that you launched has that returned a result. I don't think it has yet. Yeah. And I think we can probably dovetail into the conversation, which is the next anyway, which is mm -hmm. how our roadmap and the StarkNet roadmap run in parallel mm -hmm. and what your expectation would be for things like how long would a combat actually take to come back? You know, how long would a raid take to come back in your, you know, from what you know at the moment, obviously you can't predict exactly how it will go. Uh it won't. It like it. It's 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 not going to be that long. Like it, it I I can't give an exact second uh, amount, but it's this is this is like this isn't like like this isn't right. Like how long this is taking right now? Um, yeah, so it's going to be, be significant. It's going to be significantly faster than this. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, closer to an EVM type machine. Um, in the future. Okay, cool. So, yeah, do you want to run through the uh, the rollout of the testing? Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So, so like right now we're we're you know we're running this internal alpha um, at like you know one to one of what we think the game should be. Um, we're not adding more features. We're just kind of fixing um, uh, you know UX. UX issues and you know just some final um, contract tweaking, um, uh, which we hope to you know run for a, a little period, for not not that long. Um, and then after that, we'll go into like a closed alpha slash beta, um, which will be like you know the final production ready game. Um, and if that goes well, then that that we expect that to open up open that up to you know probably most of the people on this call will be interested in that. Um, uh, and then after that, then we can open it up to uh, then we'll do an open beta for a period of time, um, and then when 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 that's ready, then we do production, um, because it'd just be foolish to you know launch an economic game like this, uh, you know without sufficiently testing you know all the economics you know of it um, deeply. Um, and everyone like I, no, I me more than anybody wants to see this game in people's hands and you know thousands of people people playing it, but you know we need to be prudent. In how we do this, um, well, you know, we're 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 all in this in this project together, really. Okay, cool. And then, how um, if you tab onto the next slide and maybe talk through, just to kind of update the people in the in the call and watching, what Start mm. Neckup plans to do over the next couple of months, and how we align our plan to theirs. Yeah. So originally, you know, Starknet was going to do this whole um, state reset thing. Which was going to be uh, quite a quite a headache. Um, uh, they're not really doing that anymore. They're they've decided to kind of change course and um, do a more 
kind of upgradable um, process. So there is no state reset. Um, uh, there is uh, there is a few like milestones like Karu One, which uh, um, is, is kind of the release of you know like the the, the kind of final version of Karu, um, which is expected to come you know later in like in a couple months, um, and that's really when we're you know when we would hope to to launch production. Um, uh, so yeah, so we're not really held up by this. Um, the, the state reset. It's just really Cairo One that we're waiting for, um, because Cairo One is like kind of a. Um, we will have to update our contracts and code. Perfect to, stereo. To um, yeah, kind of conform to that. <laughs> so that's really what we're waiting for. Um, but yeah, as I said in the, in the previous slide, like you know, we're that's not going to hold hold up any of the testing. So you know, we can sufficiently test this game as much as possible and this game is going to go on you know it's an eternal game so like it's going to go on for a long long time so you know it's best us um you know get it right um rather than rush it um and you know at the same time we're building all these other things which we'll show you in a second um that you know everything's being built in tandem and you know we had nine teams enter the the matchbox hackathon and build stuff uh, for that um specifically for this ecosystem so you know there's a lot of there's a lot of movement going on right now, which is amazing to see. Wonderful. All right. Well, shall we, Amaro, are you... Are you, are you Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the floor's yours to do whatever you want with it, mate. All right. I thought I was just going to show you the visual things I've been working on. Um, let's see. Do you want to steal the, steal the screen share? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Does that work? Do you all see my screen? Yep, we see it. Fantastic. All right. Um, so the first bit that I was working on with another illustrator was the website, if you remember from last time. Um, that uh, back in the day, we, we, we didn't have much visual stuff to go on. So uh, this is really sort of the initial step uh, of exploring things. And some themes were established. Um, I think we've since sort of gotten a better idea of, of how to approach the visual language of this. These images were done fairly quickly. Uh, I think the illustrator is very talented, but uh, she had like one, one day an image. So. Um, I think I, I, I've been wanting to build on top of that. And this still looks quite anime, um, and I, I wanted to move away from anime. Uh, also because I, I think Loaf wasn't a fan of it either, and, and, and so in general. Um, so in terms of theming, what um, we sort of landed on was, was that, um, well, it basically all started with maps, right, with the, with the realms which are really just the SVG of a map. So um, uh, we decided to run with this theme, which would be um, sort of a print map aesthetic, basically. Um, and then I did a bunch of research on like woodblock printing. This is Hiroshi Yoshida, which is a, a amazing Japanese woodblock printer. Um, it's it's an ancient tradition. Uh, also in Europe, you find lots of it. Um, these images were taken by Secretive, who, who went to the museum for it, which is which is really cool. Um, and so, yeah, this this is kind of the aesthetic uh, I'm going for. Another famous one example is uh, Alphonse Mucha. He's he's like a, um, from the Art Nouveau movement in France. Um, also, these really cool like patterns and frames and, and things like that. Um, so I really want to get across this, this feeling of paper, texture, print, essentially. Um, and let's see it. So this can, this can manifest, for example, in, in the troops. Uh, I've, I've tried to go a bit more in this direction. Um, and ultimately, I mean, these troops are, are, are better than the placeholders we had a while back. Uh, they still need a lot of work. The idea is that ultimately the the troop colors and and really uh, this should also apply to buildings later on um, should be 
sort of specific to each group. Um, these colors aren't final either. There were some community inputs on how to change them and make them more distinguishable and, and, and group them into different affiliations and stuff. I will touch this again. Um, until then, uh, the group images will, will just be this one color, uh, which is like the default color of the order of power. Um, eventually, they will all change uh, according to the order um, of the troops. Uh, the same will happen for the buildings. Um, then the this was Sorry? the loud crack the victim heard. He slipped into her house through. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Yeah, Sorry. No, keep going, mate. Yeah, keep going. Keep <laughs> going. <laughs> All right, so um, I also wanted to retouch the sort of Eternum main image, which uh, if we go back to the, to the website, uh, looked like this. Um, again, I wanted to get back into this um, print aesthetic. Um, and this is what I have now. It, it still needs a lot of work. Then... Furthermore, we've, we've sort of stumbled upon, in, in the process, we've stumbled upon this idea of the snake as the icon of Eternum, because it's, it's uh, very commonly understood to be like um, death and rebirth, and there's this uh, Ouroboros symbol, which is hundreds or thousands of years old, of the snake biting its tail. Um, then I've sort of made this into a Mobius strip of sorts, uh, a little bit like MC Escher style. Um, and, and this is sort of the icon as we have it now. Um, I'm hoping for the, the upcoming events in Lisbon that I can make a 3D version of this, which is what I've been working on today. Um, sort of, we can give this out as a little 3D trinket. Uh, that's, what I was, that's what I was doing today. And I, I want to make this snake more detailed um, and, and make an actual like crown out of it. Uh, right now, I'm fighting with uh, with this IMM brush, which really doesn't doesn't really want to fit onto the thing. I'm sure I can figure it out. Um, so that's what that's what I'm doing right now, and I want to give this crown that I'm making out of the icon. Um, I want to give it to this guy as well um, to really bring this snake theme, this sort of icon of eternity, um, into into the various aspects. Uh, including as well the UI, which which I've been working on a little bit, um, and so I, I want to like put a bunch of snake details everywhere um, to, and still keeping with this sort of print theme, uh, paper stuff. But you, you can see there's there's snakes everywhere. Um, I think it's a very evocative icon that has a lot of history, um, and yeah. So this is basically the kinds of things I've been working on these days. Um, yeah. All right. That's the other Amazing. Thing. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. I, I love the I love the uh, the journey from low fidelity to high fidelity. And so we often have the conversations Amara and I about like what do we share? And obviously we want to share things that get people excited. Uh, but we can never really reach perfection because we're always like, well, we'll come back to this because we have to move on to that. And actually, it wouldn't be great to do this. And then we look at the resource required and we sort of have a, you know, rethink about things. So there's a constant journey of of kind of getting to a distinctive like look and feel and creative direction and like building story into the imagery. Um, and uh, so we... We don't want to kind of want to go away and and then come out and go ta da in six months time and show you something and you don't go on that journey with us. So that's why you know you see things as they um, progress and they grow and they become richer and more distinctively realms. And that's what I think Amara is doing like fantastically with the styling, with the cartography style, the print block style, the working of this iconic. You know the the, the snake represents eternal creation and internal destruction which is perfect for the world that we're building which runs forever but has entropy so yeah it's all tying narratively really really fantastically into the look and feel and the promotional content we're creating so love it thanks much appreciated kind words 
so that was it. I think we'll just do a quick, there was a quick interlude before we get back into what I think is more, um, a little bit more abstract with the discussion around adventurers, which Loaf, um, I think Threeps here as well. So you might want to sort of interplay that between you guys as you then yeah. move into the... All right. Well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll give a rundown of, you know, uh, where, where, where we're at, where we're heading. Um, with it, and then Threep can show um, show and tell the um, the crawler that he's made. Um, Wonderful. And give one of those amazing Threep presentations that I always look forward to. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, I mean, we we've had this idea of adventurers in our white paper since like February, um, and you know the the idea has always been um, that. You know, to create a real rich on-chain world, you know, you need you need lots and lots of people, um, and you know, we want to avoid the, this whole like artificial scarcity with this um, with this asset. So, um, the idea is that these adventurers are very low entry into the ecosystem. Um, you know, probably like ten dollars. That will be like a fixed um, USD price, um, but they'll be priced in lords. So, you know, when the price of Lords moves, the price of, um, uh, you know, the, 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 if, if, if it costs 100 Lords um, right now, um, you know, when, if, if Lords is um, double that, then it'll cost 50 Lords. So it'll all be, always be pegged to the USD. Um, it'll never, you know, fluctuate. And that just allows people to enter into this game um, uh, very easily. And so the idea of the adventurers is that they are these on-chain characters. Um, they will... Um, they'll have their own unique interface to them. Um, they'll be able to equip loot items. Um, they'll, uh, you know, you'll be able to um, uh, kind of use them on a realm um, as a ruler, um, and they'll be able to earn XP. Um, you'll be able to crawl them in dungeons, and you'll be able to, um, you know, use them in any, any other experiences, which um, Threep is about to show. Um, and so... Uh, another another really interesting thing um, that uh, DHAM's been working on uh, for the past couple of weeks is um, everyone's probably seen, um, I think we posted a couple of screenshots, um, but everybody knows, I hope by now, what, you know, Stable Diffusion and all these um, text to image um, uh, prompts are. And so uh, DHAM's um, made this backend. Um, so we've got a custom uh, Stable Diffusion backend running here. And um, the idea is that... Uh, We've kind of like curated a bunch of these prompts, um, and uh, this doing this whole character creation um, process, um, you kind of use these prompts. And uh, oh, did my screen die? Oh no, we're good. Um, and because they're all kind of similar, we kind of get a similar result for everyone. And so you know you don't have to put in any prompts; you just kind of select the um, you know what you want. So I don't know. We'll do a female goblet. Um, female orc, um, green skin, bald, red hair, <laughs> um, and um, so this will take a little while, but and, and and so you know this this whole process, uh, I'm you know I'm just like I'm really curious to see what people pick for their for their character because you know right now they're like you know these these images like they're they're not perfect. Um, but some of them are really, really good. And, you know, what we can do from this is, you know, we can take these uh, images after they've been minted and, you know, people have been running around with them. Maybe some of these adventures become quite infamous. And, you know, in six months' time um, or 12 months' time when, you know, these AI generators are even better, um, you know, we can convert these into, like, 3D um, avatars. Um, and so, you know, these, his these, these adventurers will have this long history from being, you know, created on this page to, you know, maybe running around in a realm as a 3D character, um, which would be amazing. So, you know, that, that's, that's the idea around this. Um, I hope this is... Do you have, did, yeah, we still got it. We still got it. it might just take a little while. Should be there. And, yeah. and this is uh, wallet level. So, for example, you might um have a number of realms in your wallet or you might have two realms and you might have 10 <laughs> adventurers and each one of them would um be represented by this wallet level pfp 
that's well, the, so yeah. it's distinctive. And also, it is the way to generate individual adventurers too. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah and there, there probably won't be a um, a limit on these, and you'll be able to tie them to you know all your like one to each realm if you wish. Um, because uh, I don't think we should put. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I. I think people want to run around on these adventurers more than. Um, you know, they might make a few. So, um, these are quite funny. Um. <laughs> uh. So yeah, this is the idea around this. Um. Hopefully, we can open this up. Uh, to people in the next few weeks. I'm hoping. Um, and we can all start. Um, minting these. Um, but. Don't hold me to that. It might take a bit longer than that. This is this is like you know we're we're still you know. Uh, core focused on on the on the alpha right now, um, yes. So um, one other thing is uh, everyone may have seen my I did a post uh, on Twitter like last week I think um, this idea around play to die, and um, uh, this this is this uh, kind of like two way market um, that we've designed that we think will like allows kind of permissionless growth. Um, and developers to build, it kind of creates like an app store like experience for developers um, and players. And so the way it works is, um, you know, this adventure NFTs, you know, the mint costs 100 lords. Um, you know, 50 of those lords go back to the DAO, um, and 50 of those lords get escrowed within the within the contract. This is just for simple maths. It might be different um, in production. Um, and so now, you know, after you've minted, you know, you've got 50 lords escrowed. Now. Now you can actually go and use that adventurer in any of these experiences. Now, you know, adventurer one, you, when you die, you might lose five lords. And those five lords um, automatically just get deducted from your, like, escrowed balance. And they get sent to the developer. Um, and so this creates this incentive layer for developers to build, you know, um, uh, contracts or, you know, experiences that integrate with the adventurer. Um, and because, you know, it's, it's always the cold start problem with these marketplaces or these two-sided things. You know, you need... You need the addressable market, and so by escrowing these lords up, uh, you create this addressable market um, for developers to come and build on. You know, in Venture Two, maybe on death you lose ten, and maybe maybe in Venture Three, you know, it's hardcore mode, and you, you actually die completely, and your, your adventurer is permanently dead. Who knows? If, you know, there's a lot of lot of possibilities we can take this, but I think the you know the one the one key takeaway for this in my mind is this idea of of the escrow within the actual contract. Um, because that creates this this permissionless market, and it's up to the adventurer to choose which where they want to go. Um, and so yeah, I just explained the whole play to die aspect of that. Um, and you know the other the flip side of that is we're calling it build to kill. Um, so the developers build to kill and players play to die, um, because you know who doesn't like roguelike games and souls like games, right? Um, so yeah, we think this is going to you know really encourage um, you know. Um, you know, we'll we'll be building games to support these um, adventurers, but and we'll build all the tooling to allow people to just you know easily make these things. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this. And um, three can now touch on you know really what the first experience that what uh, we've built for these things. Um, three, do you want to um, take over? Yep, I'll take it from here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for dealing with the <clears throat> excuse me the fifty stream cap. I know that I was ducking off so that people could get on. It looks like Redbeard has a mirror now. So if you click on my name once I start streaming and it's full, you can just jump on Redbeard's stream. Uh, let me figure out how to share my entire screen, which always freaks me out. I'm going to turn off any text messages from my wife about my kids pooping real quick. Cool, did that. All right, now I'll share. I think we can do thirty FPS. Great. So let me know when people. Can see my screen. Let's try and go full screen here. Okay, is it visible? No, I got it. You can see it. Beautiful. Okay, and hopefully it's a big Krypton Caverns X Realms image and not an embarrassing photo of myself. Not wearing any clothes, right? It's beautiful. Okay, it's beautiful. I got the right tab. Great. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've been on a couple of these uh, Lord's Tables. It's really fun to jump on and to host as opposed to just watch. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Threepwave. I am a core lord as well as a developer of a collection called Crypts and Caverns. And for almost a year now, we've been talking about integrating Crypts and Caverns and Realms. And I'm very excited that 
as you saw, the realm's eternum alpha is finally to a place where some of us can start peeling off and shifting our focus to the future. Um, and so I wanted to walk through what we've been doing uh, to integrate Crypts and Caverns and Realms. We're still very early. In particular, I'm really excited about the model that Loaf just showed off, because one of the things we've been trying to crack is um, how do we incentivize developers to build in this ecosystem? And it's very rare that you align developers that build great content get rewarded. And I think that that's what we're hoping to accomplish with the whole play to die thing. And so I'm happy to be the guinea pig of that concept. Um, so just taking a step back, if you remember, oh my gosh, this is so loud in my ears. I'm just going to be talking. Um, you've seen Loaf, myself, a couple of the core lords up here talking about resources, what we're going to do with Crypts and Cavern and Realms, but we haven't actually given you a major update on what the game itself is going to look like. So first I want to just give you a video of what we've been working on so far here. You can see all the different core lords working together to build out the Crypts and Caverns prototype. And now that the soundtrack is not blaring my ears, the second thing I want to share is if we flash back, um, here is the first shot, the slide that I shared to the Loot Town Square and eventually on the realms, uh, the, uh, realms uh, table to show people what we hope to accomplish with Crypts and Caverns. Eventually, if we are all going on adventures, where are we going to go to adventure? Where are we going to, what are the experiences we're going to have together and where are they going to take place? And that's where Crypts and Caverns came about. And so this was the last slide I think we showed um, on the Lord's Table as well as the Loot, Town, Loot, um, <coughs> Loot Town Hall, where we walk through that your dungeons will be available on StarkNet, will generate rare resources and items, and we tightly integrate into Realms gameplay. And there's this lovely little tiny line at the bottom that says, lots of decisions, TBD. Uh, and so since then, we've been working on Realms, but also thinking through a lot of these decisions. And so I'm going to start to share some of those with you today. Just to be super clear, many of the decisions have not been figured out yet, uh, but I wanted to walk this group through so we're no longer building in secrecy, and you should expect to see regular updates going forward about how we're integrating Realms and Crypts and Caverns. And so at the base level, what we're building is a game built on in the Realms universe where you can explore dungeons, fight monsters, and earn loot with a capital L loot, meaning the loot collection, not a uh, random abstract loot. Um, it is a fully on-chain game on StarkNet. So just like Realms, I'm a firm believer that everything we build should be done fully on-chain. Um, we may have some things like a game server that might do some client-side animations and things like that, which we'll see in a bit. But the core game logic is always going to be fully on-chain in the same way that the Realms Eternum game is. Um, it is tightly integrated into Realms, meaning we've talked about some of the resources that will be generated. You are going to bring your adventure and use your adventure to go into these dungeons, and you'll see a bunch of other Realms references once we start to crank on the actual lore and content of the game. And finally, it's going to be built in a game engine. Um, I use the word proper here. Depending on your definition, I'm right now building in an engine called Phaser, which is a web-based game engine, um, something that doesn't support mobile. So we'll figure that out as time goes on. But it was important to me to, if we want to onboard a bunch of game developers, we need to make sure that games in the Realms universe can be built with a game engine, not just uh, in web-based tools. And so we set out to build a fun dungeon and crawling experience in the Realms universe. And there's a ton um, of challenging decisions you have to make. So to start, we set a couple principles in place. The first of which is that adventuring should feel risky. You mentioned that Loaf mentioned uh, the idea of dying, permadeath, et cetera. We haven't locked down how that will all work, but we wanna make sure that you're not just opening up a browser, opening up your game client, clicking a couple buttons, kind of feel like you're just farming a couple resources and then you're done. We wanna make sure that when you go on adventures, it's not guaranteed that you're gonna survive. It shouldn't be just, you go to a low level dungeon, you run through it, everything is easy, you kill a couple monsters and you're done and you walk away. Um, most of the runs you go on should feel challenging and you should feel like there is risk involved, whether those be the lords that you put in your contract or that those be your items, et cetera. We haven't worked out what you might happen when you die, but we want to make sure that there are consequences baked into this game. So that's our first design principle. Second is that each dungeon run should be unique. There's a trade-off between building a set of dungeons that people can memorize and imagine if you go back to the same dungeon over and over again, you become an expert at that dungeon versus bringing people a unique experience that feels new every time. Uh, we're leaning towards dungeon runs feeling unique. And so the sense of the, you won't be able to build mastery for a specific map. And the idea here is for two reasons. One, we think it's important because we expect a large number of people to be playing to start to open this up so that there are more and more unique experiences and you don't just get tired of the maps we provide. Uh, after a couple weeks or a couple months. But second and more importantly is that um, if we want to combat bots, 
it's very easy for a bot to figure out how a map works, to develop the optimal path, and to figure out how, that, uh, how they should run it every single time. And so by creating unique dungeon maps each time, or unique dungeon runs, excuse me, each time, we can make sure that the, the experience favors players, or at least is fair, more or less, between players and bots. So bots don't have a significant advantage. Because at the end of the day, I think we want to cater to players. We want to support bots. But we want to cater to real people logging in a meet space trying to play this game. And finally, um, session length should probably be at or under 30 minutes. Um, we are not talking about two to 10 hour epic raids with 50 people. Uh, we're talking about something that you can consume in a short period of time, maybe while you're on your daily commute, maybe when you come home at night, maybe before you go to bed. And so um, that was a helpful guiding principle as they started to lay out the first prototype and how big should the maps feel? How long should it take you to work through them? So I also wanted to lay out the creative process. I know I'm talking a lot and not showing as much at the moment, but because I think it's important, a lot of people in this space have not worked in the games industry before, seen how a game is built. And I think a lot of, uh, at least myself, before I started working in games, I assumed that you just like had an idea, you build it, you ship it, and people love it. Um, and there's actually typically a lot more back and forth within the process. So I wanted to lay out what the process looks like and where we are in this process so far. So the first question is, what kind of game should we build? We have some nice constraints here. We know that we're working within the loopverse. We know we're working within the realms universe. And so we know that it's going to be fantasy-based. We know that there's going to be these realms and that they have physical places. We know that crypts and caverns fit in there. Um, and it took us a while of talking back and forth to figure out, like, okay, how do we want this game to actually work? And what do we want it to look like um, at a very high level? And so we settled on some basics, as you saw beforehand. We want it to be a dungeon crawler. We want people to be moving through the dungeons. We want them to have certain types of experiences. And so we started the concepting from a game design standpoint. Um, we have not started concepting from the art standpoint. And so um, the work that Amaro was showing earlier has not been, um, we haven't gone to Amaro and said, hey, we're working on this Dungeons game. We need help with concept art. We are nowhere near that step yet. So this is still very, very early. Just want to set expectations. Typically what happens next after you do some early concepting is you start to um, run a process called pre-production. And in pre-production, what that means is you're going to build prototypes to find fun game mechanics, which is what I've been working on. You're going to run concept art sprints, and you're going to try to come up with a feel and a concept for what you think the characters should look like and how the, the visual aesthetic should look like. And you're also going to prove out some challenging technical details. So for example, Loaf has been hacking on Cairo smart contracts to figure out how do we represent these dungeons in the game in a way we can do in a scalable manner on Cairo on a regular basis. So we've been doing some game design prototyping, which I'll show you in a bit, and some kind of like technical prototyping to see what's, what Cairo and Starknet, excuse me, are capable of. Then you play test. And so I am trying to work as fast as possible to get this first prototype into play testing. We're not quite there yet, uh, but the idea is that we're going to start doing play tests just like you're seeing with the Realms of Turnum game. They'll probably start small and internal to start, and then we'll broaden it in the same manner. You'll probably see us follow that same playbook for each of our game projects. So we are at the tip of that arrow under pre-production, and oftentimes games go through uh, you know, three, four, ten different iterations of this loop where you're trying different prototypes to find fun mechanics, figuring out technical challenges, figuring out what the look and feel of the look should be, and then bring those all together. And once you've done that, then you move into production, which is where we're figuring out what the right, uh, taking that art style and then uh, productizing it, rolling it out, making sure that every single asset is well, uh, well lit, has a nice style, et cetera. Making sure that on the technical side, we're building code that is scalable and we can launch, et cetera. And so um, typically in pre-production and play test, you do some spreadsheet work, you do some code prototypes, you do some technical deep dives and you do some art stuff. When you move into production, you're doing a lot more work to actually flesh out, okay, instead of just saying, we'll have some monsters, like who are the monsters? What do they look like? What do they, what is their story? How do they work together? What attacks do they have? How do they all fit together? And then making sure it's all balanced. So I just wanna be super clear, we're not at that step yet. And then finally, once you ship, you move into live game mode where you ship improvements, patches, et cetera. If you've ever played a game like World of Warcraft, you can see that game will probably perpetually be in live game mode where they're constantly making improvements on things. And so we are at the pre-production phase. I'm waving my hand in the air as if you can see it uh, on this game. Uh, we don't have a name for it yet, so it's super early. So as we actually started creating the game um, and we started creating these prototypes, we wanted to take into account some very high level constraints. You know, any platform and hardware you're building for brings different constraints. If you're building for the Wii, you have to think about that crazy nunchuck controller. 
if you're building uh, for the Atari back in the day, you have to think about frame rate and memory and whatnot. And so here's some of the constraints we've been thinking through. The first is secrecy. How do we keep the map hidden so you don't always know everything? On most blockchains, everything is open. And so we have to make sure that when a user, if you already know the outcome of the dungeon, you already know how much damage each attack is going to do, and you know what monsters are going to show up and how much damage they're going to do to you, that's not a very exciting or interesting game because it's almost like the whole future is foretold. You're just pressing a button to work your way through it. Next up is transactions. Uh, Loaf showed some work on a tournament we've done to avoid having to click submit transaction over and over and over again. The last thing you want to do when you're working right through a dungeon is constantly be clicking submit, 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 submit uh, for every single turn, two to three times a turn, et cetera. So we're going to need to figure out how do we avoid those constant prompts. And then finally, and this one has been, uh, was a surprise to me, is that even though we can do a lot of complex stuff on the blockchain, actually figuring out how to maneuver on a 25 by 25 grid, which is the size of some of the Crypts and Caverns dungeons, actually takes a lot of compute and storage. And a lot of the techniques that have been come up, people have come up with in uh, even like semi-modern game design in the 80s and 90s are very challenging to do on a blockchain. And so that was a wild card for me that I didn't expect, that Loaf has been awesome at helping me think through and doing a lot of the work on his end. So these are some of the constraints we've been working through. But from my perspective, constraints can actually be a good thing. Some of the best games in the world were made under constraints. And those constraints actually give you a box you can work in. In this case, it's a crazy bright uh, screen with a couple rotation. You can rotate your, your ship back and forth, or left and right, excuse me, and you can shoot and thrust back, and that's about it. So working within these constraints, we started to figure out, find, and identify some opportunities. And so because of those constraints I listed, for inspiration, we started looking at a couple different genres of games. The first is there was an era in the mid-80s called BBS games, or bulletin board system games. These are games that were typically low fidelity graphics, text, and a little bit of ANSI art. You can see my favorite one here called Legend of the Red Dragon. And this game actually, you used your keyboard enter commands. Each time you hit a button, it would send that command to a server, which you dialed into with your modem, and it would come back with the result of what happened. And so it's actually a lot like the model we do uh, we look at with blockchain today. It's actually very analogous. So that was the first area that I started to look for inspiration. I spent a ton of time going back and playing old BBS games, which uh, I highly recommend if you haven't. Um, next is MUDs. And MUDs are, again, more of a niche. They're a text-based adventure game. Um, but there's some really interesting um, servers out there for MUDs because everything you do is in text. It means you can be very expressive. It means that you can talk about things and create gameplay scenarios that are almost impossible to represent in graphics. But it's all done via text, and you're moving around this, different, this world. And so again, there's actually some really interesting patterns that I looked at in the MUD ecosystem that may be able to, we may be able to apply. And then I looked at some more traditional, kind of what I'll call dungeon crawlers, whether it be Zelda, Binding of Isaac, um, a lot of different games that have you moving through dungeons and figuring out what makes those fun, what makes those interesting. Um, one that I really liked is called One Bit Adventure. And for my prototype, I stole some of their art. Uh, and so I wanted to call that one out because it's a great example of a really simple game you can play on your phone. Um, but it actually is pretty engaging. And there's a lot of constraints put in place, like you can only move upwards on the screen that make interesting choices from a very simple set of rules. And so those are some of the places that we pulled inspiration from for this first prototype. And so again, I mentioned that we have to view our constraints as opportunities. And so some of the solutions that we're playing around with is for secrecy, we're gonna use an Oracle. So we're actually not gonna rely on the built-in randomness. We're gonna work with an external random provider and make sure that you, can, you cannot predict the dungeon in advance. And then right now we're revealing almost like one tile or one door of the dungeon at a time, which you'll see in the prototype. Uh, next is we're gonna continue batching transactions via multi-call. And we still need to figure out how do we make those transactions feel natural and build the UI in a way that it doesn't feel like you're constantly clicking a button to move forward. And then for compute, which for me was the most interesting part to work through, we've taken an approach of creating a graph based on each dungeon. And I'm gonna jump out of my presentation, I think, right, to show you what that looks like. Um, and so within a dungeon, as a starting point, one of the questions was like, what information do we have to work with within each of these, within this uh, problem space? And so actually, if you look at the things on the right, so on the left is a Crypts and Cavern dungeon, if you're not familiar. On the right are many of the parameters that are available. And we actually have a lot of parameters available. There's a name, there's size, there's doors, points of interest, is this a legendary dungeon, et cetera. And each of these um, can be used as signal when we're creating a game around these maps. 
And so here's an example of how I tried to create an interesting story about a dungeon um, using GPT-3 and Midjourney, which are two AI, um, AI platforms out there. So on the left, you'll see all I fed in was that prompt up top, write a fantasy description about a dungeon, it doesn't have a ruler, the environment is Dendrid Oasis, and the location is a legendary dungeon called The Mouth. And it spit out a pretty solid story um, that at least as a, at a high level description, excuse me, I'm sorry, the high level description of this dungeon is pretty compelling. It even says like, the entrance of the dungeon is a large gaping maw lined with deadly sharp teeth. There's a dragon and anyone who enters will be immediately devoured. Now we have the makings of a story in this dungeon and we can run these generators every time to create new settings, new storing, stories, et cetera. And on the right, you can see um, an image that was pulled up via mid journey. Uh, we put this together. I did this when someone bought a legendary dungeon, but it gives an example of how we can actually start to play with some of the, the different pieces of this dungeon here, the location, the environment to make something that starts to feel interesting. And now I'm gonna show you how we decompose the dungeon using Cairo and Starknet and what this prototype is gonna look like, at least the first version of our, the first prototype we put together. So this is a dungeon called Sunken Shrine. Um, if I remember correctly, I think it's like uh, 15 by 15 or 16 by 16. It has some tiles you can walk on. It has some doors and points of interest. And so this is a pretty standard dungeon. Um, what we first wanted to do was drop a user at a random location here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Let's imagine this is a starting point. So we mark that as a starting point. Then we calculate all the paths possible to see where a user can walk. And then we could drop enemies in and perhaps even the dungeon owner could drop enemies in and rig traps in their dungeon to stop people from traversing and to catch them. Because uh, in the end, as you know, we all want to kill the player. The player wants to survive. So we thought that would be an interesting dynamic. What we ran into is some of the pathfinding algorithms that are typically pretty trivial um, in a game engine as we look at today, like this A star pathing uh, algorithm. We're actually pretty challenging on, uh, with Cairo and StarkNet. And so here's an example where these ninjas, whatever they are, they're moving through a scene. They're trying to find the most efficient path. They can leap across water. They have different moves they can use. And eventually they go from the left to the right. And from a game perspective, this looks really simple, right? The graphics are simple. The characters are moving. Sure, they're moving quickly, but these seem like, it seems like a pretty simple set of decisions to make. Do I walk across? Can I jump across this water? Yes or no? Um, and so I wanted to show you an example just to give a sense of what types of calculations are required here and why we didn't go down this direction. So if you look at this, this is an example A star search algorithm. You're going from this starting point to this ending point, and you can see that it's a little snake that moves around, and it pretty much just does obvious stuff. Like if I want to go here, it's going to go here, here, or something like that. So this seems really basic. Um, unfortunately, if we try to do a jump, this is a 15 by 15 map, like down here, let's say, Let's see the search info for how much information was used to calculate that. You now see that there's a ton of different cells and a ton of different information and data used to calculate that information. And so what appeared to me as someone who's been doing games for a while as a trivial, like, oh, just do some pathing, throw like a star or dice strip algorithm in, actually takes a lot of compute and a lot of storage to be able to do that efficiently. So this caused us to go back to the drawing board, as I mentioned in my initial talk. We took a different approach that Loaf came up with that I think is really promising. Instead of representing the dungeon as a grid, what if we represent the dungeon as a graph, which you can see here on the right? And if we want this experience to be the same every time, oops, I zoom in, um, what if we generated a new graph based on each dungeon every time someone comes in? And so this is a simple, simple graph, probably simpler than we would ever have, where you start from point zero, you move to point one. From here, you can move to point two or to point four. And actually, as we started to look at more complex graphs, it, it starts to look like a dungeon map, or at least like a map you can explore. And so this is the direction we've been focused on in our prototype. You can see on the left here, there's a data structure with a bunch of points. I'm not going to go into how that works. Uh, if you're interested, you can reach out to us separately, or I can share more detail on Twitter. But on the right, you can see you have a starting point, which is zero, and you work your way through this complex graph. And you, there's twists and turns. And imagine each of these different nodes has different stuff in it. So that's the base starting point for our prototype which I'll now finally, after 50 minutes of talking, show you. Um, again, I just want to share that this is very early art. Some of the art I took from other games or other collections um, because I just wanted to get this concept playable as quickly as possible. I did add some animations and whatnot that I made, but uh, the art is not made by our team, just to be super clear. So this is not a commercial product. So this is our first view of what this game could look like. Um, you can see on the left here, 
there's a little equipment panel. And so imagine if your statistics show up here, and then right down here is each of your items. Uh, these are items from uh, the loot contract. And so imagine if you have different swords here, different armor that you can equip over time. This is the equipment your adventurer wears. And so at the, the idea here is that you quest to reach these dungeons. You try to acquire resources and gear, which will then let you become more powerful and tackle more difficult dungeons. Now, we don't have a concept of dungeon difficulty yet. That's something we'll have to figure out. But that's the core loop is going to be you go and explore some dungeons, you fight some stuff, hopefully you don't die, and you make your adventure more powerful. And so imagine this panel represents your adventurer here. The next panel over is just kind of hard-coded right now. But imagine if each room you move to has an AI GPT-3 written description of what's happening here. And each room has a set of actions. Like you can open a chest, you can move to the next room, or you can use the escape rope. And the escape rope means that you would actually exit the dungeon. You'll see what's important in a second. So this panel here could be generated via AI and give you a unique set of prompts each time as you work your way through the dungeon. So you're not just kind of like clicking next, next, next. Um, I expect this might be a little bit like quest text in an MMO. Some people read it and enjoy it, some people won't, but it actually adds some color to the experience, especially as you imagine different dungeons with different stories, different environments, et cetera. And the types of things you would see in a desert dungeon might be very different than for example, in Ever's Glow, which is kind of like a fire dungeon. And so this gets us to the gameplay itself. So in this case, there's an adventure. Um, I took the adventure from one bit adventure. So I just copy pasted it in. Um, but, and then I took some other arts here. So this adventure starts at uh, tile zero. And so imagine your graph, this is like node zero, excuse me. Um, and then the adventure can move between different doors. And you'll see that the only door I can move to is one that has an arrow in this direction. I haven't drawn the arrow, but you can see I can actually move through this. And so each door has, uh, can be opened or closed, and you can traverse your way through the graph. I'll show you how that works in a second. And then imagine if based on the points of interest or the doors on this map, for example, you could see a boss, or perhaps you could see a treasure chest that has already been revealed uh, based on this map. And so that would make you think that, well, maybe maps with more points of interest, maybe I should go run through those ones because they'll have more interesting loot. And so those are some of the variables we're gonna be playing with as we move from early concept around gameplay to that production side of things and balancing things. So those are some of the things we've been looking at. Um, at its core right now, the prototype is really simple. I just wanted to pull down um, a graph that was generated on StarkNet in Cairo. So this graph you're seeing here was generated on chain by Loaf, he has a contract for it. We then pull it down into our client and then we display it. And then I've added, I plugged it into a game engine called Phaser. And then I've added uh, art, as you can see, which is interactive. And as the adventurer moves around the world, you'll see different events are gonna get fired that are gonna cause different things to happen. So I'm gonna pretend there's sound effects here. He walks his way up and you see like da-da-da. And now an enemy pops up and the, the adventurer slaps it with his sword and the enemy dies like da -da 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 -da. And now he walks up to the spot. And so imagine that simple combat animation that I put together happening as you traverse through this dungeon. And maybe you don't know what enemies are here. And first you saw a skeleton, then you see a ghost. And again, you go through the combat. Right now, it's all hard-coded, so you win after one hit. Um, but this is kind of how this prototype is shaping up. And so what I want to do is run this with more people as I pull out some of the hacks I put in place to get this presentation running and to let you see what it would be like to explore a graph-based dungeon and see, is it interesting? Does the combat feel good? Do we think this graph-based approach works? And so that is the step we are at. Again, it's super early, but this is the first first prototype of a graph-based dungeon crawler uh, that integrates tightly into the Realms ecosystem. And I'll pause there. Amazing. Yeah, it, it, uh, I think you you gave it solid lead up, you know, because you know this from the surface level. If you just drop get dropped onto the screen, it looks rather um, mm -hmm. simple, but the, you know. A, that that whole graph model um, and doing that all, all all that on chain and having that generative um, is is the real key here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think we're super early. Um, I think it's an early prototype. We'll probably crank out a bunch of prototypes like mm -hmm. this. But to me, after just even clicking to it a little bit, there's something interesting about it, and we've got a lot to play with here. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to start wiring this up to have some mm -hmm. items pop in, have some of the enemies be real. Um, I think we have something at least work. Worth working through work. work excuse me, worth working through. Yeah, and we just keep scaling up the fidelity from this. 
And that's yep, the point. That's right. It's that it's it's that slow iterative it's that iterative process of, of of starting working on something, getting the game loop, then iterating up. Yep. Cool. All right, I'm gonna unshare my screen so I don't show everyone all the oh, Discord conversations I'm having. Question for you three about uh, cool. from D from DSI. Um, what about mud stroke op craft? Could we see something with similar with CNC at some point? So, Sorry, can you ask the from... question once more? Yeah, it's. Um, do you know the um, mud game engine that? Um, yes, Zero I'm familiar. Part. Yeah. So the question is from DSI. It, it is. Uh, what about mud? Stroke OP craft. Could we see something similar with CNC at some point? Okay, thank you. The stroke I was uh, confused by. I think my American naivety shines through here. Um, yeah, so I'm very interested in the MUD project. Behind the scenes, this uh, is all built using what's called an empty component system, which is the same architecture that MUD is built on. It's also the same architecture many games these days are built on. Um, I think it's very promising, and I like the idea of, idea of using it on chain. Like from my perspective your game server lives on chain. And that's what MUD is trying to do as well. Um, I don't know if we'll use that particular tech. I think that that idea of having ECS on chain is great. Um, but so I think the concept is great. Whether that's the right implementation or not, I'm not sure at this point. But I'm in their Discord chatting with them and I have some uh, experimental projects that I'm trying to play around with to see uh, how it works. Okay, cool. DSI, did you want to unmute and ask anything further on that? Or did that answer your question? Awesome. Okay, he says awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Cool. Well. Uh, yeah. I, I guess just to sort of round off um, this part of the project, I think, or the call, I think what we've we've illustrated here is that um, the realms gaming ecosystem. We're building out all these kind of uh, um, primitives and laying down infrastructure and solving all these problems, which means that other people can come along and build games in the ecosystem that use these modules and use these um, elements in all sorts of different ways. And there's a push and pull mechanism between the players and the builders. Um, there's a kind of cat and mouse game of the, the builders needing to lure the, the players in with their adventurers because the adventurers are risking their lords. So, you know, it, it, that's how we believe that we're going to get really amazing gaming content created by people inside the community and people who join so to take advantage of of creating fun games that people want to engage with um so yeah i think that that probably wraps is there anything else you want to say on this section loaf uh not specifically i think i think through covered it very well um uh yeah uh, maybe uh, i think i may have said it before like uh, like the, yeah, the, the primitives that we're making here and the adventurers um, uh, just open up this platform. Um, uh, you know, they make make it easy for people to come and and build on, and also get you know compensated for building. So you know that's really what we're trying to do here, and um, the the you know, the crypts is the the first you know example of that. Okay, cool. Right. Well. Um... Casey, I see that you're on the call. Are you able to unmute? Hello there, sir. Hey, hey let me uh, go share my screen here. How are you doing? You well? Yeah, doing well. Just, uh, yeah, just uh, kind of off tour and uh, been working on uh, some of this uh, Realms music. So I've been composing and coming up with uh, um, a you know coming up with general direction and aesthetic for um realms and you can check out some of those ideas in the music chat um you can uh you know and we've been trying out a lot of different um you know iterations of ideas um and i think we're we finally caught a couple of like instruments and vibes um and a few kind of compositional ideas and um uh, that that kind of work for you know uh, when you're navigating the site and um so I've been uh, working on that and in parallel to composing, I've been developing um, musical operations in StarkNet. Um, and when you combine these musical operations like harmonization and transposition and variation uh, operations with randomness, you can create some uh, kind of unique textures. And I've got a uh, 
uh, React uh, client that I use to sort of interact with uh, StarkNet, and you can kind of hear that. Um, this is some of the music that I've been uh, working on for it. I don't know if you can hear it at all, but um, yeah, we can. It's great. Yep. So yeah, that's uh, and and this is actually a, the track that I had been um, working on for uh, for Realms, and so now we've got it in the client. Um, it's a matter of, um, and I've got these kind of variation algorithms. Um, uh, it'll be stuffing this uh, data into a contract in a really compact way. You can see there's a lot of like with these chords here, repetition, um, and you know with just slight seeding, I can kind of create uh, different voicings and uh, chords with this. And uh, with these melodies, they can be transposed and varied so that uh, the idea is to have, uh, you know, a unique musical experience each time uh, you're coming to the site and then, um, you know, iteratively, iteratively to uh, basically rig the music to both the game logic and, you know, uh, you know wallet and and player state and uh but uh so yeah this is where i'm at right now and um uh like for an example like uh got so many windows up uh, i see if i can uh, well that's probably the easiest one to share right now but yeah man this um, this is this this song is wonderful like play this song for a minute let's just listen to it i heard it in oh the sure album. yeah 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 let me wonderful. uh okay so yeah and then uh i'll, I'll get, pl play it right before the drums kick in added like a lot of I made this sound font out of different synths that I have and samples and so it's all sort of customized for the game You know, so that's that's the general vibe of of this track, and um, I think the the goal is is you know an, I've got this uh, React player into uh, this is right now f for it's an easy way for me to interact with my variation smart contract stuff and and write music and test things out, um, but to have like a small player that uh, can be you know embedded into the realms game where. Um, you know, we call a StarkNet function, and it uh, sends all of this computed music uh, to the the player, and we can uh, vary that over time. And so you get this really like long form musical experience while you're playing the site. And um, and then the goal, of course, is to have the the game logic much more integrated into all the sounds that you're hearing. But this is the uh, kind of uh, you know where I'm at thus far, and. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, kind of where I'm at. It's amazing, and um, we are super grateful to have you know uh, somebody who has both managed to turn their hand to Cairo as well as amazing composition. And I know that when I was playing with the pre-alpha today, the beginning of that track is kind of spooky, and it was kind of giving me sort of a jangly, a jangly vibe as I was preparing for my raid. So I, I, I thought it was perfect. <laughs> really loved it. Awesome. And so, yeah, and and, and, and it really that channel, the, the, the music channel is just an open channel for people to see. I don't think everyone has right permission, but it's an open channel for people to go and see the kind of interaction between Casey, who, if you're not aware, is one of the, the, the members of the Fleet Foxes and is touring the world with his music and is a multi-instrumentalist as well as being like uh, uh, now a, a, a Cairo wizard. So, you know, a complete unicorn. And we're so super grateful to have you composing the music and the, the soundscape for, for the realms world. So, yeah, no, we love it. So, yeah, yeah the, the music class. channel is there. You can go and see the, the um, works in progress as they're shared. Thank you. Right Casey. on. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, could you mind screen sharing again, please, Loaf? Because then we are, we've got, I guess, some, um, just some other news to wrap up with. And then if there's time for questions, I think we are, 
yeah, we'll try and wrap up in, in five minutes. Unless there's lots and lots of questions. But yeah, if you can share screen below, that'd be helpful. Um, it's just gone black. Is it black for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. No, there we go. AOB, AOB, that's good. Hey, did the, did the um, the, did the, the the raid get return uh, result? I'll check in a second. Hang on. Okay, um, sure. Yeah, I'll do the I'll do the AOB and then we can um, yeah. we can look at the the the, the raid result. I don't know why this isn't showing. I think I may have. Hang on, let me. Uh, it's just it's just gone black. Oh, I might just have to do it at the screen. Yeah, just, can, we'll, just okay. we'll just do it. We'll just do it here. That's, yeah, lovely. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing is, um, if you tab on one slide, please, the um, growth of the core lords. Um, as we kind of identify um, specific uh, tasks or specific um, requirements for the. The community and for the game, we are um, seeking people with the right skill set and passion from the community, and we've had like a real um, uh, just so much fresh blood join the team, and it's been fantastic. Um, so, Loot Hero has, uh, you know, he he's uh, well, like a loot historian or a loot architect um, or loot, um, sorry, loot uh, archaeologist rather. And, um, loot hero rather. And he has joined, um, he's a developer by trade anyway, as well as being, uh, you know, incredibly involved in loot and the writing of the loot developer kit and, um, his hands in the law, uh, and the Genesis project. So he's kind of everywhere with loot. Uh, and he is also working on, um, with us now as one of the core lords. And he's the person that is uh, writing the Cairo contracts with um, with Loaf and the team, which will um, give the loot items when they're bridged over to Startnet um, characteristics, attributes, physics, materials, that kind of thing. So that's super exciting. Um, Lord of Lee uh, has joined. He um, he is uh, one half of the Mistrals. You might have seen some of their music around. But he's joining to help on um, Cairo generally and is generally getting involved with everything that's sort of happening. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, Gogi Bear has joined to work with Lord Abrax on um, the Bibliopedia and to drive forward community created law. So to try and, and weave together the law that's being created in all sorts of different projects and kind of understanding what we are going to take into the realms world and what we're going to sort of leave behind and we're going to develop for ourselves and what's canon and what isn't canon. And there's a hell of a lot of thinking that goes into that. So Gogi Bear is, is rolled up his sleeves and is really passionately going in, into that and sorting out a process for that, working with Tim Shell and Abrax and others in the community. Uh, and and Calcutta, um has joined to um, help us have a proactive relationship with guilds. So to think about the guilds we want to work with, the ones that um, that add value to games, we don't want to work with guilds that 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 um, you know try and operate Web three games like sweatshops. Um, so, you know, we want to find guilds who will philosophically share a vision of of what games should be with us. Uh, and so he's also working with um, Distracted Dev, um, on sort of product manage and develop Guildly, which is the plugin which allows people to, to share realms, assets, and play together. So that doesn't just mean like a guild which has got, you know, 100 realms. That means like maybe, you know, two people who share two realms or three realms. It means that they can work together to um, manage their armies and manage their defending armies and manage their raids and manage their trading and resources together um, because, you know, the realms runs 24-7. So working together cooperatively might be fun. So, yeah, um, also on the next slide... Um, it's just a, a welcome to DSI, who has joined as core lord. He, uh, or sorry, noble lord rather. He has um, just just been such a constant contributor uh, in the development channels, and is just on a mad, mad journey in into the Cairo space. And yeah, we love having him around. Um, yeah, 
welcome to the noble lords and then next up yeah thank you we've, we've sent out some messages to say thanks but thank you again for supporting us through gitcoin um it was the best supported project in the i'm just not sure if it was just loot and also open gaming i think definitely loot not sure about open gaming but um yeah it's just there was over 600 people who donated towards the project and that will go towards us developing you know bridging starknet um sorry bridging the loot over to starknet so it's a pretty cool cause so thank you very much uh next up uh, yeah and then we um worked with matchbox who are also you know um making a, a big bet on um starknet being the right environment for the development of rich and enjoyable games and so we partnered with those guys to run a hackathon and um I think um, that there were multiple different things you could do in the hackathon, you know, challenges you could answer, but the majority of people built um, on Realms, so that's cool. Um, we had nine really cool submissions that, you know, not a small amount of work to conquer Cairo, prepare repo and documentation and, and a presentation that was uploaded to YouTube. And that's brought a load of new blood in terms of builders into the DAO, which is good timing because we're going to start to kind of you know, port those guys into people uh, into building games using the sort of adventurer system. Uh, the judging for the hackathon is is ongoing. It's 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 people from all across the Startnet space um, who are judging that. So yeah, that that continues. And I think it's over to Squiddy now. GM Orgs. Hello, there, Squiddy. Hello, hello. Um. Yeah, so the Lord's Unlock is now complete. So uh, just a reminder to everyone that it was a DAO vote to reduce the emissions and unlock all the Lord's Rewards from the Galleon between Epochs 11 and 35. Um, that was a pretty much a unanimous um, decision uh, voted by the DAO. Um, so yeah, the, the 10 unlocks over the 10 weeks are complete and the next unlock for the Galleon Lords will happen when we're on Starknet. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of Lord's housekeeping. And the guidebook, Loaf, I don't know if you want to get this up, um, but um, we've touched on it a bit. Um, but yeah, so it's a community-driven guide. Um, obviously, the, the game isn't a zero-sum game. Um, the more we help, um, I guess, uh, the information out there for new players to come on board, the better. So this is going to be a collaborative thing with um, players to submit, you know, strategies and other such things into the guide. Um, so there will be a guide on how to contribute. But at the moment, it is the alpha is the alpha guide is live, but it's constantly changing as. You know, every three days we have a pretty big update, but it's kind of stabilizing now. Um, destructive Dev um, and Calculator, who are on the Guild, they'll be um, adding the the Guild Guide as well. Um, so it should all be seamless, and we'll have many guides on how to kind of um, do what you want to do into in the ecosystem. Um, yeah, so this will be anyone can contribute to this. Um, it's just a you know it's an open source um, repo. You just have to write Markdown. So I mean, look w w when when the kind of you know uh, alpha and uh, alphas are up and running, then uh, it'll probably become a bit more relevant. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, cool. Yeah, I think to the next slide, Loaf. Um. Yeah, so if uh, I'm actually getting on a flight in 12 hours to go 24 hours to the other side of the planet, um, <laughs> to Lisbon, so um, if anybody is there um, and wants to meet up, uh, I know there are a few lords going, just um, just DM me and um, we, we can catch up for a drink or, or something. There's loads. There's loads of us going, I think. All right. There's probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's probably going to be a half a dozen of the core lords and, and certainly a lot of the nice. people there will be there as well. So, yeah, we are descending, I think. Descending. The, the lords are descending. We need those, Waiting. like, cult robes. Um, 
<laughs> Sacrificial robes. I do. I do. I, do yeah. I did get some flags printed. I've got some realms flags. They're kind of a, a, a bit like pirate flags, but not quite as as um, authentic and uh, and 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 sea worn. But they're pretty cool. I like them. I don't know what to do with them, but I'm taking them to Portugal. So nice. Yeah, we'll, we'll find a role for them. Uh, and then well, the last thing to cover off was just. Road. We talked, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. We, we've talked about we, renting. We need rope, rope merch, and and we, <laughs> and we need masks. We need to to make and sell creepy masks, Lord masks. So, are you imagine like actually going to to the Lisbon and to the future ETH conferences in in Lord's robes? I think Is it's it... a great idea. We should do it. <laughs> I've also got a couple of crowns for for, for the yeah, yes. too, so yeah. Full metal armor right. and a great sword. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be um, great. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that these are the things you know. We'll, events will we will do that kind. Of, you know, the foundation is is on the way to being set up, and it will allow us to to, to be a bit more flexible with things we do in in the real world that cost real money. So watch this space. But yeah, the final thing is to say that um, Grug. Uh, Grug's Lair, the, um, the team um, have put together some analysis, like a report of the project, um, which is available on the Grug's Lair website. So, yeah, check that out if you want to kind of get into a bit more detail about the game. And obviously the, um, the Master Scroll is, I guess, the official document about you know, what we're building and the direction we're going in. So I think that's it. I think that that's right. part yeah. of the par parlay, the AMA. One more slide. There we go. Was that? Well, an hour and thirty-five minutes. What are we saying now? Forty-five? Yeah. Did you? Or now? No, well, no, no. It's seventy-five to ninety. So we've gone. Seventy-five. To, all right. We're just we're, we're pretty close. Yeah. Anyone? Does anyone Not have bad. any questions that you can either type into the the chat here or just un unmute and ask? I'll be going and having a double espresso in about 10 minutes. Lovely. Yeah, well, I think, I think we probably can just... <laughs> that bathrobe, <laughs> crypto, great. Yeah, that... <laughs> we need more silk. But no, it's yeah. got to be... I think it's... It's, it's, uh, it's got to be... Well, that's quite fresh. It's, you'll be like a GM wife as you come out of the shower. Yeah, in your that's the uh, yeah. Dressing robe. <laughs> that's GM the uh, that, that's the king's robe. Red beard. <laughs> oh yeah! Wow. Yeah, that's 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 fancy. Yeah, well, um, merch, awesome. merch events and things. You know, we'll, we'll come back to that stuff. But yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, Great. yeah. Thanks, everyone. So yeah, right. see you in Lisbon. Thanks, guys. Going to be there, and then until next time, see you later. Bye, bye, bye. All right, bye, bye. Ciao.